God, thank you so much for your word. Uh, what a, a good God you are uh, to rescue your enemies from only offenses against you. Uh, it was nothing neutral in us that uh, we needed saving from. There was uh, only enmity uh, against you and hatred for you, a disregard for your commandments and a disdain for showing you the honor that you are so worthy of. God, you rescued us uh, eagerly from these things to even think that you loved us in our sin and humbled uh, yourself in the person of Christ to to become a, a sin bearer that your son would take on all of the guilt and filth that we incurred, that we heaped on ourselves, that uh, we enjoyed. Uh, folly is like a joke to a fool, your word says, and, and we certainly delighted in what displeased you, uh, not fearing your wrath as we ought to, and yet you were so kind to, uh, at great cost to yourself, make atonement for us. And you accomplished what we never could have, and God, we could never even return uh, adequate thanks for these realities. As we turn to your word now, I pray, God, that you would give us an exalted view of Christ, that you would uh, stir up noble and pure affections for you that you would, as a result of us gazing into the truth of your word this morning, motivate us, move us to be holy men and women and children, that we would honor you and see your glory as worthy of all of our allegiances, all of our obedience, all of the strength that we can muster to be holy and put your character on display. And we trust you to accomplish these things in us, knowing that you desire your own fame uh, more than any of us or all of us put together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As we continue our discussion of the doctrine of sanctification this morning, I want to direct our attention to what must be the foundation of all holiness, of all Christ-likeness, wherever it exists, it must be founded on the gospel. If our ultimate hope for sanctification rests with us, if our ultimate hope is in our own ability to be conformed to Christ-likeness, then we're in big trouble. If you just think about this past week, maybe this morning, uh, ways that you have failed to adequately honor the Lord, to obey Him, duties that you have missed, that you have neglected, that you have put off, then you are well aware that your hope cannot be in your own ability to be sanctified. Your hope cannot be in your own obedience. And so our work in becoming holy must be based on Christ's work to make us holy. Our sanctification practically is only possible because of Christ's work in sanctifying us positionally and this passage this morning in Hebrews chapter 10, you can turn there, is going to remind us of this reality. God has gone to great lengths to secure for himself a holy people. He has gone to the ultimate length in giving up Christ for us to ensure that his honor is forever displayed in 
a holy people. This morning we'll look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. And this passage is going to demonstrate or describe for us four pillars upholding those who are being sanctified. Four pillars upholding those who are being sanctified. Starting at verse 10 in Hebrews chapter 10, it reads, reading from the Legacy Standard Bible, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest, stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies are put as a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That last phrase in verse 14, those who are being sanctified, that's where we're going. That's where this passage eventually takes us, is to consider that reality those who are being sanctified. That is, currently, right now, there are people who fit this description. Those who are being sanctified. Presently, in this moment, in this day, that is a way of describing every Christian. There is no Christian who is not being sanctified. That looks different in different seasons. Some seasons include more fruit-bearing. Some seasons include less. There are difficulties that shake us and interrupt what might otherwise be a strong pursuit of sanctification. But nevertheless, Christ's people are those who are being sanctified. There is no other kind of Christian in Scripture according to what God says. And so as we get there and consider those who are being sanctified, what we want to see in this passage, what this passage is going to show us, is four pillars upholding people who fit that description. The foundation underneath which we find uh, the ability to be sanctified is not based on us. These realities, these pillars, upholding and sustaining, undergirding our sanctification, all have to do with God himself. And the outline is simple. These four pillars include a better will, number one, a better will, a better separation, a better sacrifice, and a better priest. A better will, a better separation, a better sacrifice, and a better priest. We'll see these unfold in this passage. First, the first pillar upholding those who are being sanctified is a better will. Verse 10 says, by this will. By this will are, is the first phrase in Hebrews 10.10. 10. By this will, we are those who have been sanctified. And so that bears the question, what will is in view? Well, this is God's will, and it's God's better will. By this will, in verses 5 through Verse 8, numerous times this word for will is being used. And sometimes it gets translated desire, sometimes it gets translated will, but it's the same thing 
that is in view. Look at verse 5. Therefore, when he, being Jesus Christ, comes into the world, this is what he says. To God, he says, sacrifices and offering you have not desired. There's our word. But a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them. These are those offered according to the law. But then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first, that is, those things offered under the law, in order to establish the second. Then verse 10, by this will we have been sanctified. It is God's will distinct from what he desired under the, under the law. It is a separate will, a newer will, another will of God that has accomplished the sanctification in view in verse 10. And why this different will? Why is God's will something not specifically uh, offered under the law, not required by the law? Back up even further in chapter 10, and we get our answer. Verse 1. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, the law can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. God's goal is to make perfect those who draw near. That can't be done by the sacrifices offered under his former will, the law. It was never intended to make perfect those who draw near. And so this will is better because it is not that which is offered according to the law. Obviously, in the Old Testament, God required certain sacrifices, certain offerings. It was meticulously laid out, the entire sacrificial system given through Moses, written in the Torah. This was all from God, handed down at Sinai. And so this sort of, uh, at least potentially, introduces some confusion about the goodness of God's will in the Old Testament. Was God's will accomplished for Old Testament saints under Mosaic law? Was God's will accomplished for them in the Old Testament who came under Moses? Well, the answer is yeah. Actually, God's will was accomplished for them. Were the Old Testament sacrifices even effective under Mosaic law? The answer is yes. They were effective for what they were intended to accomplish, though. Were the Old Testament sacrifices sufficient for the Old Testament saints? The answer again is yes, absolutely. But they were only sufficient for that which they were intended to accomplish. Flip over to Leviticus. We'll see this. Leviticus chapter 4, and you can see the efficacy of the Old Testament sacrifices. Le Leviticus chapters 4, 5, and 6 lay this out very clearly as God further instructs the people having established the tribe of Levi as his priests. 
there's this repetition that you find in Leviticus that the worshiper reading it, the worshiper hearing the law, would have been banking on because it came with God's own promise to the worshiper. Look at verse 26 in Leviticus chapter 4. After, specifically regarding the leader who sins unintentionally, breaking the law, verse 26 says, And all its fat he shall offer up in smoke on the altar, as in the case of the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings, and this would be the result. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him in regard to his sin, and he, that is, the leader who sins unintentionally, will be forgiven. And then, verse 27 and following demonstrate or detail the same thing, but in regard to the common people. Now, if any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any of the things which Yahweh has commanded not to be done and becomes guilty, if his sin, which he has committed, is made known to him, then he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female without defect for his sin, which he has committed. And then it details the process. He shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering at the place of the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and all the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar. Then he shall remove all its fat, just as the fat was removed from the sacrifice of peace offering. And the priest, notice, shall offer it up in smoke on the altar for a soothing aroma to Yahweh. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, and he will be forgiven. Again, last verse in chapter 4. Then he shall remove all his fat, just as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offering, and the, pe- and the priest shall offer them up in smoke on the altar, on the offerings by fire to Yahweh. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, in regard to his sin which he has committed, and he will be forgiven. Fast forward to chapter 5, verse 10. So the priest shall make atonement on his behalf for his sin which he has committed, and it will be forgiven him. Again, verse 18. So the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his error in which he sinned unintentionally and did not know it, and it will be forgiven him. And then again in verse 7 in chapter 6, And the priest shall make atonement for him before Yahweh, and he will be forgiven for any one of the things which he may have done to incur guilt. There's that repetition. The priest makes atonement, and what follows is forgiveness. The priest makes atonement, what follows is forgiveness. If the Old Testament sacrifices were not effective for the purpose laid out here, then we have a big problem because God says, that they accomplished forgiveness. The question is, since they were effective, really the question is, what were they effective to do? And it was forgiveness, but only in this temporary way. And only for the particular sins done unintentionally that are mentioned under the law. See, God's own character, his own faithfulness, is riding on the effectiveness of the sacrifices to do what he says they were intended to do. And just like the Old Testament saints were dependent on the priest making atonement and accomplishing in that 
forgiveness for them. So we, our entire hope is staked on God's faithfulness when he describes another priest, a better priest, Jesus Christ, offering a sacrifice that will accomplish forgiveness on our behalf. If God was not faithful to the Old Testament saints to accomplish that temporary, earthly, only for a short time atonement, then we shouldn't have any confidence in God accomplishing the eternal redemption in the New Testament either. The same God must be faithful to his word. But this will in the New Testament is a better will specifically because it does something that the law was never intended to do. And that is further proven as we go through our passage, namely in the fact that it was only offered once. Inherent in the Old Testament sacrificial system was a reminder, this isn't enough, to accomplish forgiveness for all time, to cover the sin that you committed for which you're offering the sacrifice, it's sufficient to do that. But to accomplish an eternal redemption, it doesn't have that power. It doesn't have that efficacy. And it's not intended to. And so this will, highlighted in verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 10, by this will, this is a better will. This is a better will. Verse 5 says that the sacrifices and offering that came through the law, that's not what God desired to make perfect those who draw near. Instead of those sacrifices, those offerings, verse 5 says, quoting Psalm 40, which are Christ's words, foretold, prophesied beforehand, Christ says, not those sacrifices, not those offerings, but you've provided a body, prepared a body for me. That means the sacrifice, the offering, is not in the blood of bulls and goats, as verse 4 says. That can't take away sin, but a body given to the Messiah, blood that can be spilled, in his person, from his person, that is effective to take away sins. Verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure to accomplish this. Verse 7, then I said, behold, I have come then to do your will, O God. And this was written in the scroll of the book. It was written of me, Christ said. So this is what God willed, that this suitable sacrifice that would perfect the worshiper would be accomplished by Christ. This required Christ's coming, according to verse 7. Christ could not remain in heaven and accomplish this suitable sacrifice. He could not spill blood unless he came. It would also require Christ's body, and it was all determined, again, according to verse 7, beforehand by Scripture. The gospel articulated in the Old Testament, a suitable substitute, God himself, would come and make atonement forever. He would perfect those who draw near, verse 1, to make perfect those who draw near. So a better will is the first pillar upholding those who are being sanctified. Anyone fitting the description that we saw in verse 14 that we read, those who are being sanctified, if you see God's grace at work in your life to sanctify you and conform you to Christ's likeness, if you are being convicted by your own sin as God's word is opened, as you are uh, receiving instruction from God's word, as you are taught by God when you are in the scriptures, 
if you're being convicted, if you are turning to Christ, if you are prayerfully depending on God to be made more like Christ, if you are humbly confessing sin to others, seeking forgiveness, striving to submit your will to God's, then you have God's own will to thank. It is God's better will for you, which is the beginning point of your own gratitude. It is by this will, not by your own will, but by God's own will that we have been sanctified. And in verse 10, by this will, we have been sanctified, or literally, by which will, we are those who have been sanctified. We are those who have been sanctified. Now notice, the have been sanctified is different than the are being sanctified in verse 14. Have been, past, with current effects, is different than the are being sanctified, which is present right now, that's happening. So these are speaking about sanctification in two different senses, two different ways. Verse 10, we are those who have been sanctified, points to a past completed action. This is the better separation, the second pillar upholding those who are being sanctified. A better separation have been sanctified. That's a past action still with relevant or effects currently extending into the present. That's a reference to what we call positional sanctification. Positional sanctification. This is something that God has accomplished on your behalf, Christian. He's done it for you. And again, this is by his own will. It's by his will, this will, of sending Christ into the world with a body, making the author of life prone to death, able to be killed. It is by that will that we have been sanctified. We have been made perfect. That's positional sanctification. Before God, as one who is drawn near to God, Christ, by the will of God, has once and for all sanctified you. He has set you apart for himself, giving you as a standing before him his own perfection, perfect righteousness, perfect holiness before him. Positionally. Not practically, not yet. That's glorification. That's coming. We have that to look forward to. But positionally, he has accomplished a better separation for us. And you'll notice in verse 10, this was dependent, again, on God alone. On God alone. This had nothing to do with us. This was uh, by his will. We have become those who, are, who have been sanctified. And it was through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. By his will, by the will of God the Father, and then through the offering of God the Son. That is why the Christian possesses positional sanctification. Why positionally we can say with verse 10, we have been sanctified, all, all because of God. God the Father, God the Son, equally involved in accomplishing our positional sanctification. This tells us something about God's disposition toward our being made holy. How eager is God for our sanctification? He willed it. He accomplished it. God is eager, zealous for 
a holy people. And so he has accomplished setting us apart. He has made us perfect. A better will and a better separation uphold those who are being sanctified. Thirdly, a better sacrifice. A better sacrifice is another pillar upholding those who are being sanctified. The better sacrifice is detailed all throughout this passage, but that is what is being uh, described in verse 10, the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This sacrifice is better in every way. It is superior in its substance. It is superior in its purpose. It is superior in its power. It is superior in its duration. It is superior in its substitution. And it is superior in its efficiency. This offering, in every way, is superior. It is better. Look again at verse 1. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things, notice what's coming is called the good things. It has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things. It can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. God ordained it that way. He intended there to be inherent in those sacrifices a reminder of sins every single year. You have not accomplished eternal redemption you need another sacrifice. Verse 4, for it is impossible by the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That is why when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come then. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me to do your will. And then again, after saying above, sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish something better. The second. This is the better sacrifice. It's superior in its substance because verse 1 says that the law only had a shadow. The law only had a shadow of the good things and not the form or the substance of those things. That's a helpful, that's helpful language. Think about your own shadow. There's nothing substantial about a shadow. The substance is what's being reflected by the shadow. The Old Testament sacrifices functioned very much that way. They weren't the substance of what was coming. They just reflected what was to come. It was a a place of worship that mirrored what was in heaven. There was an earthly priest to play the part of what would eventually come in Christ, the ultimate priest. There was a There was furniture and fire and an altar and the very presence of God in the Holy of Holies and divisions between God and the people. All of those things pointing to greater realities, for sure. But they weren't the ultimate substance. And the fact that they had to offer sacrifices year after year on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16 details that, proved the point. You need something better. You need something more. This isn't sufficient to finally, once and for all, remove the sin. That's why almost as soon as the sacrifices were made, 
there was still a lingering consciousness, awareness of sin. There's something else better, something else necessary. So it's superior in its substance, and it's superior in its purpose. As we already saw in Leviticus, the purpose of the Old Testament offerings and sacrifices were not to once and for all perfect the conscience of the worshiper. Only Christ could do that. So here Christ comes with a superior purpose, which is why he can say and why the psalmist put in these words in Christ's mouth in Psalm 40, God hasn't desired in this sense for this time sacrifices and offerings. For the purpose of removing sins and finally sanctifying, positionally sanctifying people, making perfect those who draw near, he hasn't desired what was given through Moses. So in this sense, Christ's sacrifice is superior in its purpose. What Christ came to do, the will of God he came to accomplish, was a perfecting of the worshipers. And it's also superior in its power then, because only it has the power to accomplish perfecting the worshipers who draw near. To once and for all perfect men and women and children who draw near to God in faith, to God, that requires nothing short of omnipotence. All power, all might available must be available to the one who would accomplish this. For centuries, to think about the amount of blood spilled day after day in Israel under that system could never attain to what Christ attained when he once and for all sacrificed himself. Three hours on the cross? Where there was darkness, God pouring out his wrath on Christ, that suffering was sufficient. That is a display of tremendous power. Absolute omnipotence being put on display in the gospel, in the cross, in Christ's dying moment. Bearing the wrath of God, that it would take one sinner and eternity in hell to absorb he would never see the end of God's wrath if it was dependent on a finite being. Christ did in a, in a matter of moments. There's a one, one poet, as one po poet says, so forever will I tell in three hours, Christ suffered more than any sinner ever will in hell. How is that true? Well, because he endured the same wrath of God, not just for one sinner, but for a countless multitude, Old Testament saints and New Testament saints, both sides of the cross. Christ bore that wrath, and so... His sacrifice demonstrates the superiority of his power, as well as its duration. Again, the, the temporary nature of former sacrifices, which could never take away sin, according to verse 4, this sacrifice accomplishes that very thing. It, once and for all, takes away sins. It is effective for all time. Look at verse 11. And every priest, this is just idiomatic, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices. But these, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. The duration of the efficacy of this sacrifice is eternal. The sacrifice is as eternal as the priest 
himself, the life of the sacrifice. Christ offered his own life. And so this eternal life that was offered has eternal efficacy, is the idea. Hebrews 9, verse 12, or backing up to verse 11, says this, But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. So you also have a better place of offering, a better temple where this offering is made. Not made with hands, that is not to say not of this creation, that is to say not of this creation. Verse 12, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy places once for all having obtained eternal redemption. This sacrifice being made even in a a better place, the redemption then being made was eternal. So that it's superior in its duration. Even the substitution is better. It is superior in its substitution because what he is offering, what is being substituted in the place of the sinner, is Christ's own life, his own body, which is why, as we've already seen, verse 5, but a body you have prepared for me. So the substitution, what's being substituted is superior, and then again, superior in its sufficiency. Throughout this passage, there's a, an emphasis at this point in this epistle on the once and for allness, the once and for all nature of Christ's sacrifice. We've seen that numerous times, even starting with uh, verse 1. In contrast to those offerings, that happens year after year. It can't take away sins, verse 3, year by year, there remains a reminder of sin. Verse 10 says, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That is uh, a term of finality. That that doesn't have in view um, all people or anything like that, but it's a once and for all sacrifice. So it is superior in its sufficiency in that sense. Finally, the the fourth pillar upholding those who are being sanctified is finally a better priest. A better will, a better separation, a better sacrifice, and lastly, a better priest. The sacrifice was Christ himself, And the one who offered it was Christ himself. Christ was the priest as well as the sacrifice. For the first time in history, the one offering the sacrifice as well as the sacrifice being substituted for sinners was one and the same. Christ offered himself. That is what is in view in verse 12. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, he did this. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies are put as a footstool for his feet. God the Son is himself the sacrifice. He is the priest who is making the sacrifice. And this is a better priest. There's never been another priest like this to remind us who exactly is being discussed. Go back to chapter 1, verse 1. Tom looked at this recently in, in our equipping, or the uh, communion message, rather. These seven details about Christ. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these day, last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. 
this one who functioned as a priest is the very son of God. He is the son of God. He has that title. And he is the one through whom this ultimate revelation of God comes. He is the mouthpiece for God in these last days. Verse 2, he's also the heir of all things and the one who created the world. He is the creator, the one who functions as your priest, Christian, is the one who also created all things. He owns all things, he created all things, and verse 3, he is the radiance or the outshining splendor of the glory of God and the exact representation of his nature. This one who functions as our priest is the radiance of God's glory. What can be seen of God's glory? The exact representation of his nature. The mirror image of God is our priest. And the sustainer of all things. He upholds all things by the word of his power. The chair you're sitting in, the clothes you're clothed in, every fiber of your being. Some of you might feel like you're falling apart. Well, he holds you together. To whatever degree you're being held together, he's doing it. Your priest upholds every molecule in the universe by his powerful word. His word is that powerful. This is the one who made sacrifice for your sins. When he made purification for his sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they have. No angel is called son. This one, according to verse 9, verse 8, but of the son God, that is God the Father, says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. God the Father calls this one God. God the Father calls this son of his God. He has a throne, and that throne will have no end forever and ever. And the, the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. God also says, verse 9, you, talking again to his son Jesus, have laid, or excuse me, have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. This is God the Father exalting God the Son before our eyes, and this same one who possesses that kind of glory, that kind of favor with God, is the one who is also our priest. His name is, according to verse 10, and again in Hebrews 10, 10, Jesus Christ. Yahweh says, Messiah. That is his name. He has a name now. The Messiah is called the Lord saves. And just notice this better priest who has weight that no other priest ever had, who has a reputation, who has a spotless righteousness that no other priest have ever had, this one, according to verses 12 and 14, was perfectly willing to offer the sacrifice of himself. It is, verse 12, he who offered one sacrifice for all time. Verse 14, by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. By the one offering of himself, Christ was a willing priest 
who willingly gave the sacrifice of himself. This passage began with the will of God and continues with the will of God. The will of God the Father is where it began, and the will of God the Son is how it was accomplished. So how eager, again, is God for your sanctification? How eager? God is zealous to have your sanctification. Every trial that refines you proves how eager God is for your sanctification. This priest proves how eager God is for our sanctification. The sacrifice proves how eager God is for our sanctification. To make us sanctified positionally, to perfect us positionally, and all to make us those who can be in time sanctified practically. And just that by way of implication, again, if God's willingness, God's will has its fingerprints all over this passage, if God has gone to these lengths to accomplish our sanctification, if his willingness to accomplish our sanctification came at so great a cost as this, this priest giving his own life, we never have to question God's love for us. If you believe, Christian, that God has gone to these lengths to save you, to sanctify you, then you don't have to question his willingness for you in this time. Right? His willingness to give you all good things out of love for you is just not, on, not up for debate. You believe these things, then you can believe the goodness of God's will, the strength of his affection for you. This better priest is demonstrated in who is the priest, is demonstrated in his willingness, is demonstrated in his completion of the job. Verse 12, once one sacrifice for all time. So we see that this is a better priest in his completion. And we shouldn't miss the ascension of this priest. Notice he sat down at the right hand of God. The fact that he finished the job is shown in his being seated currently. In the temple, there was nowhere to sit. In the tabernacle, there was nowhere to sit. Why? Because you don't sit down. You're busy making sacrifices. There's no chairs. There's no sofas. When you walk in there, you're not taking breaks. So Christ, by, be, by virtue of being seated, demonstrates that he's done offering sacrifices. But his ascension being demonstrated in where he is currently. He is at the right hand of God. He has been exalted by ascending into the very presence of God, he is seated at his right hand. That favorable position of God the Father is where Christ is currently. Not here any longer. He's ascended. <coughs> the superiority of this priest, the, the better nature of this priest is also shown in his patience. Verse 13, what is he doing? Seated at the right hand of God, he's waiting. God, is, God the Son is waiting at the right hand of God, and he's waiting for Psalm 110 to be fulfilled. He's waiting for Psalm 110 to be fulfilled 
until his enemies are once and for all put as a footstool for his feet, until they are made his footstool. That hasn't happened yet. His enemies are still present. Satan uh, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He has not finally subjected Satan, demons, sin, death, and all of his other enemies and men to his feet. That's coming. You can write down Joshua 10.24 because that imagery is shown there very clearly when Joshua takes the five kings out of that cave and instructs the, the commanders of the army to put their feet on the back of those kings' neck and he says, thus God will do to all of your enemies as you continue conquering the land. So when the enemies become a footstool, it will be proof positive that Jesus reigns as king. And that will take place when he comes to reign on earth. When he brings his kingdom, he will subdue all of his enemies at that point. Satan will be bound for a thousand years and... Christ will have no enemies to speak of because he will remove them from the earth. Notice in verse 14, this is also uh, articulated in Psalm 110, that this priest is also a conqueror. Uh, or verse 13, he's the, he's the one who will be conqueror. But verse 14, the superiority, the better nature of this priest is demonstrated in that he was effective. Verse 14, for by one sacrifice he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Anyone who is currently being sanctified, Jesus has perfected them for all time. Before God, you have, been per, you have been perfected. You have been positionally sanctified. You have been justified. Christ's righteousness has been imputed to you. All of those things are true, but they're only true for those who are being sanctified. And so that, again, puts an emphasis on you're currently being sanctified. Are you, Christian, being sanctified? You can have the confidence that Christ has perfected you by this one sacrifice for all time if you are being sanctified. So be sanctified. Be sanctified and be confident that you have been perfected by this one sacrifice for all time. By a better will, by a better separation, by a better sacrifice, all accomplished by a better priest for those who are currently being sanctified. God, thank you so much for these realities. What thanksgiving could we return to you? Uh, any degree of gratitude would be pleasing to you, but also insufficient. And so make us uh, acceptable worshipers who bear the marks of a holy life, who receive your instructions to us, who press forward, press on toward holiness. And God, as we do, as you work in us your own good work, we pray that you would give us the confidence, the joy that comes with knowing that Christ has made a sufficient atonement for sins. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.